So this is the last lecture in this series, and uh, it's all about thermal remote sensing and particular uh, uh, low temperature thermal remote sensing, i.e. sort of the temperature of uh, the land, the ice, uh, that sort of thing, as opposed to uh, high temperature events such as fire. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll move on to my, uh, my lecture. So I've broken this lecture down into four different categories. So I'll present a bit of background. I'll then go through some of the challenges in measuring land surface temperature. Uh, then a set of slides on uh, some of the various applications. And I'll finish off with the current capability. So this is what the real state of the art is in, the, uh, in this particular field. So not everybody might be aware of what land surface temperature is. You've probably heard about it. Any, anybody who sort of works a lot with, uh, with uh, uh, ESA uh, data sets, uh, you've probably heard about land surface temperature, but you might not exactly know what it means and how it differs to air temperature, which many people are familiar with. So, so land surface temperature is actually, uh, uh, in, in layman's terms, a measure of how hot or cold the surface of the earth would feel to the touch. So it's, it's a radiative uh, temperature. It's not the sort of air temperature uh, uh, which is measured usually at sort of two metres height in, in, in these sort of white Stevenson boxes uh, at MET stations. So it's not that, it's completely uh, separate. And we can measure it using uh, airborne or spaceborne remote sensing instruments or even uh, small handheld radiometers uh, at ground based. So we can install these on towers, for, for instance, and measure uh, the, the surface temperature of a few square meters. And it's the aggregated radiometric surface temperature of the ensemble of components within the sensor field of view. So that's a few meters for a radiometer uh, near the ground. For, for a spaceborne, it's something of the order of 100 meters to one kilometer to five kilometer, dependent on the sort of uh, satellite sensor that, that's doing the measurement. And it's an entirely independent temperature data set than the air temperature uh, essential climate variable. And for climate, it, it's uh, LST is, is very important because it's an evaluation of the land surface and land atmosphere exchange processes. Uh, it's a constraint on the surface energy budgets and the flux variations. And you can use it for global and regional observations of surface temperature variations. So you can actually fill in the gaps in the global air temperature record by using uh, the relationship between the surface or the skin temperature, the LST, and the uh, near surface or air temperature. And we measure it from satellite using uh, either uh, thermal emission in the, either the uh, infrared or the microwave atmospheric windows. So if we think about uh, one of the uh, most used currently LST data sets and, and one that's I increasing in, in, uh, in exposure is Sentinel-3. So Sentinel-3 is of course one of the Sentinel series of, of satellites launched by ESA and managed by uh, Copernicus. And Sentinel-3 has different sensors on board. One of those is called SLSTR. SLSTR measures land surface temperature and it measures sea surface temperature. So this is an example here. This is just a Google Earth image. Uh, so what we got here, we got the uh, area around Washington, uh, DC. And if you'll see there's the urban corridor all the way up to, uh, up, up to Baltimore, uh, further up the Chesapeake Bay. So that's it, a Google Earth image. If we overlay this with a LST image from Sentinel-3, what you can see quite clearly is the uh, distinction between the urban and the rural areas. So, so you can see very clearly that 
uh, Washington is warmer, uh, as is Baltimore, and you can see the urban corridor blowing up from Washington to Baltimore. You can also see where there's uh, uh, forestry in, in, the, in the region as well, and that's usually cooler in the day, as is this inlet of water uh, for, uh, as well, the, the river. So immediately, without knowing anything about it, you can see features in this LST map, which tells you something about the area that you're looking at, whether it's urban, whether it's uh, rural or semi-urban, and, and also whether you're looking at predominantly sort of forest or farmland. Farmland tends to be warmer than forest uh, 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 as a general rule of thumb. So that's just a uh, something to, to get your flavour of what we're going to be talking about today. So why is LST uh, really important for climate? So it's increasingly being recognised as an essential parameter for diagnosing Earth system behaviour and evaluating Earth system models. It provides a globally consistent record from satellite of the radiative temperatures of the Earth's surface and is a crucial constraint on the ed energy budgets. And this is particularly the case in any moisture limited states. It's a metric of the surface state when combined with vegetation parameters and soil moistures. So it's related to the driving force behind vegetation phenology. We can also fill in the gaps, as I've mentioned, with the surface air temperature record. And this is particularly the case where you've got regions with sparse uh, air temperature stations. So parts of Africa and the Arctic are very, uh, very sparsely covered by these MET stations. So we have large areas where effectively they interpolate the data between these MET stations. We can use the satellite data to infill that, those areas as long as we understand the relationship between the air temperature and the skin temperature. And one thing we can say for certain, the climate user community is already using and really needs LST data. So it's, it's increasingly important. 10 years ago, nobody was really talking much about LST data. We were getting a few users using some MODIS data for certain applications. Now it's, it's really uh, in the ascendancy and it's been recognized very, very uh, strongly by the climate community as, as one of the core variables into the future. So how do we measure it? Well, we use this, we do it using Planck function radiation curves and a radiative transfer equation. And as for the atmospheric window, we tend to use the window between eight and 13 microns in the, so the thermal infrared. And we use specific channels within that atmospheric window. And generally we use two channels. So we, we what's called a split window approach. And, and the reason being is we can use the different absorption of the atmosphere in these two different windows to do the, uh, to do the atmospheric correction. And the media relative temperature over <coughs> a pixel area <coughs> is given by this equation, where sort of this is the radiance measured by the satellite sensor. And we have upwelling radiance emitted by the ground. We have upwelling radiance emitted by the atmosphere. And then we have downwelling radiance emitted by the atmosphere and reflected by the ground. So in a bit more detail. So this is a simple radiative transfer uh, uh, equation for deriving LST. So this is what we want, LST. And we have to know what these other uh, other measurements are. So this is what's measured, uh, the brightness temperature measured by the sensor channel. So each sensor channel on the satellite instrument will measure a brightness temperature. And this is what we have here. 
this is what we want and these are the other uh, ingredients we need to we need to uh, know or calculate so we have surface emissivity and we have atmospheric effects where we have downwelling effects and upwelling effects and this is the uh, transmittance through the atmosphere so to derive LST is simply a matter of uh, deriving uh, this equation so you want LST as the as the the function of the equation so we can do this with infrared or microwave retrievals now most of this talk I'm going to show you today will be about infrared uh, retrievals primarily because that's uh, that's where my group uh, is a leading group on, on uh, LST we have some very Good colleagues who work on microwave retrievals who would who would probably give a far better talk than I could on microwave so I'll be concentrating on the infrared today there is advantages and disadvantages with either approach so the advantage of microwaves is they can penetrate cloud and so you get a much more continuous source of data so, so that sounds great that's you know so why why don't we just use microwaves why do we even bother with with infrared and there's a couple of uh, reasons for this firstly the signal originating from the earth is stronger in the infrared rate wavelengths than it is in the microwave because the Planck function peaks in the infrared the surface emissivity of the materials in the infrared is also higher and also more stable so there is a lot more uncertainty within a microwave retrieval than there is in an infrared retrieval so in infrared you get a much more robust retrieval from space another disadvantage is that measurements from microwaves are a much lower spatial resolution so uh, at best you're getting sort of uh, 12 kilometer pixel resolution as opposed to uh, generally one kilometer for thermal infrared if you're talking about central three or or MODIS or even high, as high as sort of uh, around the 100 meter resolution if you're talking about the thermal channels on Landsat so, so there's a couple of uh, definite advantages of, of, of thermal infrared but of course we do have the the issue that we have to uh, cloud clear our products so we don't want cloud contamination so we have to correct in any retrieval we need to correct for atmospheric effects and even though the atmospheric window that I mentioned the 8 to 13 micron is there is high transmission uh, some of the attenuation of the atmosphere is significant and most of this is due to water vapor absorption there is also some depression of the infrared radiances because of stratospheric and tropospheric aerosols and we need to account for both of these effects as well as the emissivity variability to avoid retrieval errors you know off, often above 10 Kelvin if we didn't uh, take this approach and the most common way of doing this is through a generalized split window so we use two uh, adjacent channels uh, in an instrument's uh, uh, spectrum so we need to also correct for the emissivity as well as the uh, atmospheric uh, effects so emissivity if you're not familiar with it is the relative ability of the surface to emit radiation so it's quantified as the ratio of energy radiated by the surface with respect to the energy radiated by a black body at the same temperature so a black body has an emissivity of one uh, all other materials have got an emissivity less than one and these can range generally from sort of around the 0.94 for sandy soils to put to over 0.99 for uh, inland water snow ice uh, and and, vege and some vegetation is almost as high as 0.99 
And these surface emissivities can be amplified in regions of high topographic variance and for larger viewing angles. So there is a directionality with uh, emissivity as well as uh, as well as the actual uh, sunlit shadow that you would you would expect to see at high topographic uh, regions. So here's an example of some emissivity maps. So in the two channels I've mentioned, so if you remember, I mentioned uh, split window channels. So generally, uh, in most instruments, so Sentinel-3, MODIS, etc., we have channels at around the 11 micron and around the 12 micron. And this is the emissivity over, uh, this is actually an area over Australia for these two different channels. And you can see in general, the emissivity in the 12 micron is higher than the emissivity in the 11 micron for different land cover types. So this is the land cover map associated with, with uh, these areas. So this is an area at the top of, of more forested uh, regions. And then we have uh, an areas of primarily cropland. We have a couple of lakes also uh, sitting in this picture. And you'll see the lakes certainly uh, stand out as having very high emissivity. And this is the resultant LST uh, calculated when we take the emissivity from these two channels and the brightness temperatures as well from those uh, equivalent channels. So we can obtain infrared LST from a number of different instruments. So this is just a selection of a few of the ones that we uh, regularly retrieve LST from. So, so ATSR was on the MVSAT satellite. This has now been superseded, of course, with MVSAT uh, finishing in 2012 by Sentinel-3 and the SLSTR instrument on that. So it's a polar orbiting instrument and it has a spatial resolution of around uh, a kilometre. Uh, MODIS, many people are very familiar with MODIS. MODIS also has uh, thermal channels around the 11 and 12 micron and also a spatial resolution of around a kilometre. And there's two orbiting satellites for MODIS on Terra and Aqua. So we get a morning uh, local overpass and an afternoon local overpass. AVHRR is the long running uh, series of uh, satellites from which you can uh, derive LST from. So this stretches all the way back to, to 1979. However, uh, the further you go back in time, the more uh, unstable the retrieval gets. The uh, satellites themselves uh, had considerable drift in their orbits during their, their lifetimes. So, so it means creating a, a consistent record across that becomes very, very challenging. And finally, uh, a Severi is one of the geostationary uh, instruments. So that's on board uh, things like the uh, me me second generation. And that sits uh, 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 over zero zero lat long. That this is great for high temporal resolution, so you're getting an image every fifteen minutes, but it's not quite so good for spatial resolution. So, at at zero zero, you're getting sort of three kilometres pixels, but as you get up into into uh, Europe, you start getting uh, five to six kilometre size pixels. So it's got the high temporal resolution, which is good for understanding the diurnal cycle, but less good in terms of if you want to look at the small scale features. And particularly over Europe, that's something you, you, you generally want to do. So I've mentioned that LST is different to air temperature because LST is the skin and air temperature is at about two meters. Well, how do they actually compare? Well, 
LST has a much stronger diurnal cycle. So the amplitude between min and max it is much greater than it is for air temperature. And for the same scene, the difference between the skin and the air can be as much as 20 Kelvin. This, that generally tends to be for a desert environment. If you look at a closed canopy, the difference is much less. And also at night time, uh, the difference is much less between the skin and the air. It's during daytime when you get these strong differences. It does have a much stronger non-uniformity within the landscape. So if you look, took a air temperature measurements and you put a load of stations all over one kilometer uh, or several kilometers, the air temperature would not change very much within that, uh, uh, that region. Whereas the, the, the skin temperature changes literally from one meter to the next meter. So it really does change uh, uh, quite, quite strongly. And particularly if you get other effects like uh, the amount of vegetation, the amount of soil moisture, all of these affect the skin temperature far more than they do the air temperature. And we have done some uh, comparisons between uh, skin temperature and air temperature. Uh, within a uh, Horizon 2020 project, which is now re recently finished, called, called Eustis. And we compared uh, Modis uh, Aqua uh, LST with GHCND, because GHCND has a, uh, looks at the T min and T max. So we could compare a better relationship using Aqua, which has an afternoon uh, daytime overpass. So this is a general uh, example of a split window algorithm. I've been talking quite a lot about the fact that you use these two different channels near the 11 micron and near the 12 micron. Each of these algorithms are slightly different. This is just an example from, from SLSTR. The MODIS one is a little bit different, uh, but they all uh, boil down to the same sort of thing looking at the differences between the 11 and the 12 micron. So, so this particular part is how we do our correction for the atmosphere. So it's the, the difference in brightness temperature between the 11 and the 12 micron. That's how we do our correction of the atmosphere. Uh, so it's basically, uh, to do this equation, to calculate this equation, we need to have a set of retrieval coefficients which have been done through radiative transfer and they, these are entirely based on uh, the land cover type, the vegetation fraction and the water vapour in the atmosphere. This changes via satellite viewing angle so that's why we have an angular effect in the, uh, in the equation and the emissivity which I've mentioned several times is encapsulated within the biome and fractional vegetation factors. So there is a near linear relationship between fractional vegetation and emissivity. So that's a bit of background. So at least you, you've got some idea of how we do the science for land surface temperature. So that, that will help you as you as we move through the next part of the of the presentation and the next part is all about measuring land surface temperature and the challenges in that measurement so the first thing we need to do is to actually prove that the lst that we have measured from satellite is actually any good now how do we do that we do that through validation and there are four different categories to how we do validation. The first one is the most straightforward, and that is comparing what we see from satellite with what we see on the ground. So we have a radiometer on the ground, we measure a few square meters, and we try to uh, interpret that against 
a one kilometer pixel from satellite. So, you know, those among you uh, who, who are familiar with validation will already sort of spot some of the challenges here. And that's the sort of the, how do we uh, downscale the satellite measurement to that what we're seeing in the ground and, and I'll, I'll mention that in a few slides time. A second way is through what's called radiance based validation and this is using a radiative transfer model to simulate what the ground LST uh, should be given a perfect algorithm and we can, we compare what that perfect state is against what the real state is. And, and, and then that delta LST tells you something about the, uh, uh, about how good the, the actual measured LST is. We can intercompare with other LST products. So, so a, a typical thing we do is, uh, to take a, Products such as Severi, which is a geostationary product, that is our reference, and we compare MODIS or Central 3, which are polar orbiting satellites, against Severi. So we do that by doing exact uh, spatial and temporal matchups between the pixels of one satellite and the pixels of another. And why that's not a true validation of what the ground actually is. It does tell you a lot of information about how consistent the different LST products are. And finally, we can do a time series analysis, and that will give you information about how stable the time series of data is. Is there any drift in the satellite orbit, for example? Is there problems associated with cloud contamination? that start becoming evident in the longer time series. So taking the in situ as an example, we have a series of in situ validation stations across the world. These are just the ones I show here are just for the uh, for the severe disk, but we have uh, lots in North America and we have some in Australia and some in China, for example. And they cover uh, different types of uh, land cover classes. And the key to have, having a good LST validation station is they need to be fairly large in terms of the, uh, the homogeneous cover. So if you've got a station uh, which is looking at a piece of grassland and it's surrounded by a by a woodland for instance just a few meters away that is no good for lst validation because the ground radiometer would just see the the grass straight underneath the tower and it would see the temperature of the grass whereas the satellite would be dominated by the temperature of the forest which is different so that would not be a good validation site so it needs to be homogeneous on the larger scale and this is these sites all are there are the challenges of course we have to have accuracy in the geolocation of the satellite we need to know what that geolocation is we need to have accuracy in the overpass timing because that's what we're doing the comparison between the in situ and the satellite. If there is heterogeneity in the landscape, we need to have simultaneous measurements of each of the surface land cover classes or N members. And then we can properly upscale that to what the satellite sees. The angle of observation is also very important because upscaling of nadir in situ measurements tends to be biased towards sunlit scenes. And we also have the directional surface emissivity that we have to take account of. 
So we make a number of assumptions when we do our validation. And that's that precise geolocation and surface area can be guaranteed. For each pixel that's validated, the same generic land cover classes can be re reliably classified. And within and between each pixel, the thermal behavior of each land cover class remains invariant. And those upscaling assumptions are, are key to having uh, a robust method of validation. So here's a few examples of uh, where we've been doing uh, more campaign based validation. So this is a radiometer that's out in the, in the UK over an area of Fenland, uh, which is only temporary. So we've only uh, only measuring for a handful of months to understand that particular season. Uh, the, the same uh, out in uh, in Patagonia in, in uh, South America. We, we did this in Kruger National Park and we with this sort of uh, short uh, one month campaign, we have to effectively surround the the instrument with uh, with wire fencing because there's a there's a lot of uh, animals in the park and they just trash all the equipment uh, and so on and, and, and so forth. So it, so we can do this in all different types of of environment. So these tend to be more campaign based uh, validations, whereas the previous slides I was showing you were permanent LST stations. So that's the challenges for a validation. For intercomparison, we have a whole set of different challenges. So now I'll try to explain through these diagrams uh, as we go. So if we take MODIS, and this is an uh, example of Terra MODIS, so, so Terra MODIS is coming down from sort of north to south at this angle uh, during the daytime. And then you get you get the positive viewing angles, uh, nadir viewing angles to the left, and uh, so to the right, and the uh, the negative to the left. So the so these are the negative viewing angles, and these are the positive viewing angles. So what you're getting is uh, because it's a uh, MODIS is a is a wisp room scanner, it effectively scans from uh, left to right. So each block it scans from one to the other. Now, if we compare that with Severi, Severi remember sits at zero zero, and it scans uh, effectively from left to right as it moves up the disk like this. So what you'll notice straight away is if you're got a sensor which is looking one way it's going to see something very different to a sensor looking from down here at that same pixel so for instance in a daytime severe view so this is north these imagine these are hills in the daytime severe is seeing mostly sunlit hills Whereas MODIS, MODIS is, is uh, as we know, coming down. So it's coming down like this. It's seeing more of the sort of top of the hills and some areas within, within uh, shadow. And you'll see again from this diagram here, the difference between the amount of sunlit and the amount of shadow that MODIS is seeing compared with Severi. And that, of course, makes intercomparison very, very challenging. So this little movie uh, shows you uh, exactly the differences between daytime and nighttime of MODIS against Severi for different seasons of the year. So, um, so what you'll see is as we get closer to the sort of to nadir you'll see that 
the differences between like for at night time or daytime between modis and severi are much less as we get to the edge of the modis swath because we're seeing entirely different pixels to what we're seeing at the center of the swath then the differences between one sense from the other become extremely large you know of the order of, of over five kelvin and this is a particular challenge in how you compare the algorithms in one sensor to the other, which is really what we want to do. It's about comparing the algorithms and their performance. A further challenge is on uncertainties. So one thing now that we're starting to see is a lot of different products, not just in surface temperature, but all sorts of vegetation products, uh, atmospheric products, they're starting to come with uncertainty budgets. Now, this is important because this tells you obviously how good the uh, data is. Now, but there's a catch. A lot of the different data sources come with a single uncertainty approximation. This, what we call this total uncertainty uncertainty and that's great that's still a lot better than it was several years ago where there was no uncertainty uh, information coming with any product however it doesn't tell you about the breakdown of the uncertainty components so if we take the lst example here we can break the lst into four different uncertainty components one is the radiometric noise. So this is effectively the instrument noise. Uh, so it's a random effect. And then there's three other uh, uncertainty components which have correlation length scales. One is the geolocation uncertainty. So this is how, how accurate is the lat long information from the sensor that you're getting in the product. It might be uh, a third of a pixel out, for example. And so that in, implies a uncertainty in the final calculated LST. We also have uncertainty due to emissivity, that's a surface component. And we have uncertainty due to the atmospheric correction. So the correction primarily for water vapor. And each of those, each of these has a different correlation length scale. And if you were to take an LST measurement at one kilometer and you wanted to propagate it up to say uh, 0.25 degrees to compare with a model, for example, and you wanted to also do that for the uncertainty, then you can't just average your total uncertainty you need to combine all the different sources of uncertainty in different ways because they propagate differently dependent on whether they're random or systematic. And if they're systematic, what is the length scale of that uh, uncertainty component? And, and this is, a lot of this uncertainty budget work is actually very new. It's only been in the last two to three years that this has become increasingly important to climate modelers to understand this uncertainty components of the satellite data and this is starting to get uh, traction in a lot of different fields not just in surface temperature but uh, in, in a lot of fields within particularly the ESA's uh, climate change initiative so that's some of the challenges I've now got a few slides on the applications. So there's many applications for thermal data. So obvious ones are in climate change, urban heat islands, surface energy balance, land atmosphere coupling. Modeling studies make uh, extensive use of LST data. So things like model validation and data assimilation. But they can also be used as well for things like land cover change detection, uh, increasingly for crop management, for 
planning irrigation regimes, for monitoring drought stress and other water management uh, applications such as evapotranspiration. And also as a complementary uh, variable to some of the, the fire variables to understand better things like burnt area mapping, the moisture content of the fuel prior to a burn, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's a whole range of different applications that we can use the thermal data for. And I've just got, I've picked out just a handful for these next few slides. So obvious ones are looking at heat waves. This had a lot of uh, press in the last few years because we've suffered in Europe some extreme heat waves. You know, 2019 was was a particularly uh, uh, particular year of of extreme heat uh, in in Central Europe, in in France and Germany, etc. Uh, and this is just to show you uh, by doing anomaly time series of the data, we can understand and map these heat waves over a time series. So this, this particular one was just coming using AATSR data. So this was on MVSAT. So of course it finished in 2012. But if we took that single sensor and looked at the anomaly time series of that, you can pick out various heat wave uh, anomalies during that particular time series. So particular ones of interest, of course, of August uh, 2003, when we had a, a, a severe heat wave, uh, particularly uh, in, in over central Europe, France, in, in, you know, uh, and the Paris region, there's some well-documented uh, uh, papers uh, of that heat wave. Data assimilation is starting to become more important uh, in terms of uh, the use of land surface temperature information. So if we take the uh, example on the left hand side, so we can look at model versus assimilated daily LST compared with the reanalysis data. So the, uh, the model is this one here, this lower line. The uh, observations are, are here and the assimilated is the, uh, is the dashed line. And you can see it's much closer to the, uh, to, to the observations than the, than the model is. We can actually use these to determine things like the uh, soil moisture as well from a model. So a model often can get soil moisture wrong. And in this particular model, you can see uh, that the green line is what the model predicts for the soil moisture. The blue line is uh, the actual ground observations of soil moisture. And the red line is the model having assimilated thermal data. And you can see, hopefully you'll be able to see that it's much closer to the observations than the model if the model runs without assimilation. Hydrology is becoming a uh, very important use of surface temperature data and the reason this is is the energy partitioning uh, for the, in the surface energy balance. So the LST actually controls the partition of the energy into sensible and latent heat fluxes. And we can use thermal uh, data to actually look at things like the sensible heat flux, like the evapotranspiration, and any errors in the LST data will lead to quite significant errors in sensible heat flux and evapotranspiration. Urban heat is another application. So this is a uh, just an example of, of London uh, over a Google, Google Earth uh, map. Uh, anybody who's, who's familiar with the UK would uh, recognize this as the 
uh, city of Manchester with some of the surrounding towns. And although it's very difficult to see, it, you know, on, on a small screen, that this works a lot better, of course, if we were in a lecture hall, uh, then you would see this quite clearly. Uh, but we were, when we first looked at the thermal image, we noticed this really strong red, uh, red image there. And so we picked this out and uh, said, what, what is this? What are these strong uh, hot pixels there at the, at the bottom of, of the city of Manchester? It actually happens to be the airport. So even at one kilometre, you can actually identify features such as an airport. And we often use this and we've used this in, uh, in applications for things like uh, over Chinese cities and looked at the growth of the uh, the Chinese city over time, the expansion of an airport by looking at the thermal data. Of course, one kilometre is great and, and we get it every single day, but there's still limits for urban work. Ideally, you want to be working with the highest resolution possible. And so we tend to try and work with uh, 90 meter resolution data from Landsat. And of course you can get a lot better uh, imagery from that. So again, if we take the city of London, you can see the river very clearly here. Uh, the, the city of London airport uh, here, rather than just a single pixel, what we can see uh, much clearer now. You can even see the terminal building as being warmer than uh, than the rest. So, so even down to the to a, a large building, we can now start picking out, uh, you know, which, which areas of the of a city are warm and which are cool. And this is, of course, very useful for urban planning, because uh, as we get experience more and more heat waves urban planners are very keen to try and increase the amount of green space within the city and to understand if there is a heat wave coming, which areas of the city are going to be most vulnerable uh, in terms of human health. And that's something we've started doing in, in the field, looking at going beyond the raw surface temperature data and actually deriving more useful indices. And in this case, the examples here are an urban heat island index, which is this one here. So, so the background is a, is a MODIS uh, image, and then you've, it's been overlaid with a Landsat uh, image on top. And you can see the urban area is up to 10 Kelvin warmer than the average of the surrounding rural area. And then we can take that slightly further and we can actually look at the, uh, this, what's called a discomfort index. So this is how uh, it would feel to a person. So by combining the temperature with some other met data, then we can, uh, you categorize it for health applications. So if we get in the heat wave coming and we see that uh, some areas of the city uh, would be extremely uncomfortable, so these uh, the sort of more orangey red areas, then that gives health officials prior warning that if a heat wave is coming, these are the areas of the city to be more concerned about because you might get more hospital admissions in those areas of the city during the heat wave. And that is far more uh, useful to uh, health officials than just a straightforward surface temperature. So in agricultural monitoring, so this is uh, how we actually use LST data in, uh, in crop monitoring, for example. We combine it with optical data, in this case NDVI, and we use this uh, triangle approach 
to actually determine whether crops are under stress or not. So as we get closer to what's called this warm edge, then crops appear increasingly stressed. There's less soil moisture available. Uh, the, the plants stop transpiring and the temperature tends to rise. Whereas on the cold edge, the plants have unlimited moisture supply for plant growth and uh, effectively maximum evapotranspiration. And so the plants are very happy uh, growing and transpiring. So as we get nearer to this warm edge, that's an indication that plants are becoming stressed and intervention needs to take place, usually in the form of irrigation. And this is an important point uh, because most, a lot of people that uh, say, oh, why don't we just use optical data? You know, you can see the plants, you know, uh, going brown if they're starting to uh, become under stress. Now, the reason we thermal data helps here is that plant stress can actually be detected in the thermal signatures up to two weeks before it's seen in the optical images. So you, you can take a field in the optical uh, image, which looks entirely green, and you think, no, that looks, that looks great. But the thermal uh, signature, uh, we've already started to detect a significant rise in temperature over a few days, even though the plants are still green. And that's because the plants have stopped transpiring water at an earlier stage to actually when they start uh, going brown. So we can, it's an early warning system for plant stress. And we can use this, this on, on larger scales, not just at the field scale, but on larger regional scales to monitor drought. And this is an example here of using uh, the difference between the skin temperature and the air temperature to monitor uh, uh, drought at a regional scale. And finally, we can compare LST and near surface air temperature to provide information on the surface energy budget. And as I've said previously, it's, it's a good way of filling in these sparsely observed observations in the near surface air temperature record. And providing you can have a good relationship between the skin and the air, then you can do this gap filling very confidently. So there are a few applications. I'll finish off uh, this lecture with showing what the current capability is in the field. So firstly, single sensor thermal infrared LST products from satellite have greatly improved over the last decade. We're now showing that we have biases of less than a Kelvin, which is, which is really good. Emissivity ac accuracy of less than 1.5%. And we have significant improvements in cloud detection. We have started to categorize the error effects. So we have uncertainty budgets that, where we have random locally correlated and large scale systematic effects. And this same type of component model applies to all processing le levels and all LST products. So the data now is of much higher quality than it was previously. We have standardized protocols we have even validation of the uncertainty budget now, not just the thermal LST, but the uncertainties attached to it. And we complement infrared LST with microwave LST. And we've even started to merge these into, into a single product. And the merging of all the different data into these uh, merged products actually helps resolve one of the key things that both modelers and many users actually want with thermal data 
is a global picture, but also to resolve the diurnal cycle. Geostationaries, as we've seen, can resolve the diurnal cycle very well, but they only give you a regional picture. The polar orbiters are great for uh, monitoring the globe, but they only pass over twice a day, once in the morning and once at night. So you want a mixture of all these different uh, types of data all within a single product. And to do that, you have the challenge of intercalibrating between from one sensor to another, uh, applying consistent algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. And so off the back of all this, we've started to produce what we call the first climate data records. So these are long-term data records of surface temperature that are good enough for climate applications. So that means very high stability, very high uh, accuracy in these data. And we do this by increasing the confidence in the observations. So improving the cloud detection. So we've gone from simple threshold based approaches to much more dynamic probabilistic methodology for cloud detection. We have started to identify and correct for the effect of aerosols on the LST. So that's a uh, significant uh, development of recent recent years. And we have started to produce the first climate data records. And this is an example here of the difference between in anomaly space between a land surface temperature climate data record and a near surface air temperature climate data record, which is called crew temp. So, so the near surface air temperature is the one that is, uh, is reported in all the IPCC assessments. What we're doing here is proving that the uh, a climate data record using the satellite data alone is just as good as the air temperature climate data record. And LST is now an essential climate variable. It was included in the GCOS 2016 implementation plan. And for it to be of climate quality, we need to meet all these different requirements. So, so in bold are the threshold requirements that every product that we produce has to meet for it to be climate quality. And we started to now do that. And a lot of this work is going on within the uh, climate change initiative. And within that, there is an LST specific project, which we at the, the University of Leicester are, are now leading. And what we aim to do from this is produce long term data records going back from the mid 90s all the way up to present time uh, for uh, the polar orbiters, for the microwave, and for a merged uh, climate de data record using both polar orbiters and geostationary satellites to resolve this diurnal cycle. And a few last words from an ESA perspective. So Many people over the last 10 years have started to use LST data more and more and more. And the first port of call has generally been MODIS, of course, because it's, it's been very easy to get hold of. It's been a long running satellite series. Uh, from 2016 onwards, we now have data from Sentinel-3 and there's two Sentinel-3s up in orbit. One, Sentinel-3A was launched in 2016. Sentinel-3B was launched in 2018. And LST is an operational uh, product from Sentinel-3. It's one of the uh, 
the few core operational products from that particular satellite. And so this is effectively the modus of the future is Sentinel-3. And we work across a whole range of different experts across the globe to try and provide the, the best LST science for the users. And so it's, this is a global effort. This isn't just what we do at Leicester or even just what we do within teams for, for ESA. This is working with people at NASA, at NOAA, uh, etc., to produce the best LST uh, data sets and the best LST science on an international basis. And we have a, a whole working group uh, dedicated to doing this across the different agencies. And the final word for, uh, from the lecture is I've mentioned Sentinel 3 quite a number of times. Uh, you may have seen uh, recently in the news or you may have heard at ESA conferences or, or etc. that uh, Copernicus missions are going to be expanded to six new uh, priority missions. One of these, the most uh, high profile of these is the, is the CO2 mission. But one of these six new priority missions from Copernicus, so these will be the new Sentinels, uh, is, uh, is LSTM. So it's the Land Surface Temperature Monitoring Mission. And it's dedicated solely to LST. So it'll be a single sensor uh, measuring LST at a spatial resolution of between 30 and 50 metres. And the whole idea is to support things like agricultural management uh, and urban heat island work, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is a very exciting uh, development of the next uh, several years. And we would hope it would launch uh, between 2025 and probably 2027. But the final launch, you know, launch dates aren't decided yet, but that's the current prediction so so this will take lst science to the to the next to the next level so that concludes my lecture so i thank you for your patience and for listening into this lecture uh i'm happy to take any questions i, 